Um, so, so what we've got here, this is the Game Max Expedition. Uh, this costs 35 quid on Amazon at the moment. And that puts it head to head with, um, uh, that puts it head to head with the Aerocool Cyclone, I think it was called, which was another 35 pound case that I did on a really super budget gaming build not that long ago. And the Aerocool was really naff on the inside, but on a 35 pound case, it had a tempered glass side panel on it, which really was a huge redeeming feature. Um, this does not have a tempered glass side panel, but already I can see from the outside, they've done something really interesting for the window on this thing. So firstly, let's peel off the cellophane so you can see it properly. Prepare for ASMR. Uh. That's for you, Hellkith. <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna open up the side panel so we can take off the inside cellophane as well. And when I take off this side panel, you'll see why it's interesting. So notice that we've got a full window panel on the side here, but um, it's edge to edge, but it doesn't have the really annoying four screw design where you've got four thumb screws on the sides, which are super annoying to remove. That much being said, this thumb screw at the back here is too tight, so I'm actually having to use a screwdriver to take it off. But once I take this off, what they've done is they've literally just made a case side panel out of clear plastic. I've never seen that before. I've never seen them do that, where just literally the whole side panel is just made of plastic, just like a normal tin one would be. So that's really weird and kind of funky, really. So uh, I'm going to peel this off as well. Uh, and now you guys can watch all the dust in the room just go whoosh onto that. So that much being said, as funky as it is, this is going to be very cheap plastic and it will scratch very easily. That's the disadvantage of plastic versus tempered glass. Um, the the see-throughness of it is a bit shimmery, um, but being ordinary plastic, this will scratch quite easily. So you've got to take care of it. Um, tempered glass you can be much more reckless with. It's cr tempered glass is crystal clear and doesn't scratch. This is the opposite of that. But it's a very cool design. I really like what they've done with that. So let's put that to one side. So looking at the interior of the case, um, we've got, uh, this is a nice compact build. Um, so the motherboard is going to come out like sort of there-ish I would imagine. Uh, and because, they, because they've because they now put all of the drive cages down in this power supply enclosure, the case is actually very uh, short, I would say, or uh, or shallow. It, it's not long, and that makes it look a lot smaller, which is good because this is a Micro ATX case, and Micro ATX is one of those sizes that a lot of people hate on because it's not really much smaller than, ordin than an ordinary case, whereas this one actually is. So um, then what we've got let me see so power supply enclosure we've got a nice little window so you can see what power supply you've got fitted um and they've got the logo there as well uh, i can see two hard drive bays hidden behind here um and then front panel mountings are really threadbare they've actually got no unless i'm going mad there's actually no fan mounts on the front which is a really weird design choice look at that it's there's no fan mounts at the front uh, that's a bit odd, but okay. However, in exchange for that, they have actually got a dual 120mm mount up the top here. So up the top, underneath this magnetic vent there, you can mount two 120mm uh, fans, which means you could put a proper water cooler in this, which is not bad considering the size of the case. You couldn't do that with the AeroCool. So thumbs up for that. They've also supplied us with a 120mm LED fan at the, at the back which is nice. And uh, according to the picture, that looks pretty swish. So we'll see what that looks like when we turn it on. Um, so yeah, uh, unfortunately that fan is one of these dodgy three pin plus Molex jobbies. So we'll trim that down to size. Um, and then other than that, that's about all she wrote. The top panel, um, again, classic budget choices here. We've got USB 3 and USB 2, which is just 
Don't bother with the USB 2 ports anymore, people. No one has USB 2. Everyone has USB 3. You don't need to cater for that crowd anymore. But at least it's got USB 3 at the front. Uh, you know, I should be thankful for that. And then front of the case, GameX logo, which... Does that light up? Does that do anything fancy? I'm looking in. Nope. That is just a logo. That's fine. But yeah, the case itself comes in various colours. You can get it in black, white, red and blue. So you can have it in more or less all the main colours. As you can see, the main accent colour is always black. And then these top and front panels are what you get your colours in. Inwin actually make a case that is exactly the same as this, except it's got the Inwin logo on front instead. So I have a suspicion that Inwin actually designed this case and Game Max bought a license for it. Um, however, overall, versus the Aerocool, I'm actually liking this already. For 35 quid, I think this is actually pretty decent. The interior quality looks much better. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to get this thing prepped up and we're going to build a PC inside it. So let's get on with that. Ooh. Oh yeah, no, that's all right. For a moment, I was a bit concerned because I was like, there's no hole in the top corner of my CPU power cable. But actually there is, there's this one here. Uh, the motherboard is actually gonna stop about there. So, oh, it'd be, a yeah, you could get water cooling in that. You could fit a water cooler to this. That's pretty impressive for the amount they've crammed into this case. I quite like it a lot. Um, yeah, it is better than the Aerocool. I gotta give it that. It's, um, well, probably because Inwin designed it. So <laughs> I want to look at more Inwin cases because they're very rare and really kind of funky when you see them. You're not a fan of water cooling? Yeah, that's fine. Each to their own. Uh, it's, it's an aesthetic thing. Um, air cooling can be just as quiet. I've got a crazy selection of fittings here. What on earth is going on with all of those? Is that a card support they've supplied me with? I'll be very impressed if it is. I think it is. We'll find out when we get to that. Um, okay, what have we got here? We've got a quick start guide. Installation manual, thank you very much. Cool. Just in case I didn't know what I was doing. Instructions for connection ports. Okay. Um, what else have they got there? Oh, that's just fan stuff. Okay, fine. <laughs> this is assembly diagram. Please in kind prevail. Okay. So, um, oh, we've got some nice little tiebacks for the cables here. Oh, this, this case is looking pretty good. I don't know if we can get a CPU cable out the back there. There's not much clearance here. It might work. Let's get our power supply out and start building. So the power supply we're fitting is also a Game Max. Um, again, Game Max do some really nice budget power supplies. Um, they're not uh, they're not premium brand. However, what we've got here is um, uh, we've got a GP five hundred, and the GP five hundred is eighty plus bronze rated, so it's not terra bad. Thank you very much. Um, however, uh, as we'll see when we open it up, the rails on it are a bit so-so, but let's check it out. So the Game Max GP series is they make some of the cheapest power supplies you can buy at the moment. And the interesting thing about them is, is despite being super cheap, as you can see, you get braided cables, which is nice. And most importantly, despite being such a cheap power supply, it does in fact have a PCI Express power lead. And this is the problem with super cheap power supplies. They often don't have the PCI Express 6 plus 2 pin on them, which is super bad. <laughs> George, I love it when you pass me the shell. So uh, the cost on this one, uh, I think this was, uh, this one was 40 pounds. So it's not much extra to get a Corsair. Um, certainly you could probably get a Corsair VS for about the same price. Yeah. Um, however, again, when you're doing a budget build and you're scraping off every quid you can from the budget, these aren't bad. Um, so if we check out the rails on it, we'll find that those are not bad. So again, we've got the 80 plus bronze rating on it and the 12 volt rail will do 400 out of its 500 watt rating. I've just realized you guys can't see any of that. So what we do, we check the side of the power supply and we look up the 12 volt rail 
And if we do uh, 12 volts times 34 amps gives us 408 watts. And a really good power supply should be doing the full total maximum output on the 12 volt rail alone. And if Slink looks at his Corsair that he's just bought, he will find that his Corsair, what was it, a 550 you got? I think it was the 550 that Slink bought. Um, and Slink's 550 will be doing something like um, 548 watts on the 12 volt rail alone, which is how you know that it's a better power supply than this one. But this one's cheap, like the budgie. So that's what we're building. Bam. So that's our power supply. Got to remove the cellophane from that. So let's get this guy fitted into the case. And it looks like we're putting it in from the back of the case on this one. So I'm gonna flip that over back into view. And we're gonna stop that in the back. What's up TDR Revenge, how's it going? You got a Seasonic, oh, I like Seasonics. Seasonic used to be the king. Um, I don't use them very often these days because they're quite pricey, but I do like them, I do like them a lot. Right, it looks like I'm gonna have to do a fan side down on this one. Normally I like to have my fan pointing upwards, but we've, we don't have enough ventilation in the power supply enclosure to do that. Um, and also this computer does sit reasonably high, so we're gonna have to do fan side down, sad face. So let's pull all of those out the way. Yeah, that's right, 550 on the 12 volt. That's how you know it's good. Right, so power supply clearance in this one, that's a little bit cozy because we don't have a modular power supply, but it does fit in. And yeah, that's okay, that's passable. Um, and we'll just be able to make that all work, I think. So let's stick some screws in the back of it. There we go. Okay, right, now let's sort out which cables we're gonna use on the back of this thing. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. You had two RM850s fail. Oh, that's terrible. I'm sad about that. I like the RM series. That makes me pretty sad. Yeah, it happens sometimes. That's the thing. You know, you can have your favorites, but some people just have a bad time with particular brands. The cables on this one are not particularly long. That's another thing that makes it slightly cheaper, but that's okay. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna put that up there and I'm gonna quickly tuck. Uh, I wanna get these cables out of the way a sec. I just wanna see if we've got, yeah, we have, that's gonna fit, that's fine. That'll be absolutely fine. So, let me see. I don't actually need a lot of wires for this one because this is going to be a really wireless build. I'm going to need my graphics card cable. And I'm going to do the meta build actually. And I'm going to take that up from the bottom. So we'll thread that into the main enclosure. We need this big boy of course, our ATX power cable. That's going to go up to probably near the top somewhere. And I'm going to put that into these natty little tie backs they've given us which I quite like. And the rest of the wires, I'm gonna cram all of those underneath the hard drive base, which will remain empty on this build because this build is gonna have a 500 gig M2 SSD in it and that's it, that's all it needs. Okay, right, so in the cable selection here, we've got USB 3 to the front. We've got USB 2 to the front. There's our front panel audio, and there's our noodly wires for the uh, LEDs and switches. Uh, those are probably gonna go to the bottom, but we'll reroute those in a moment when we've got the motherboard in place. So I'm gonna tuck that stuff out the way for a sec, and we're gonna get our motherboard fitted. So let's go to one side and unbox our MOBO. Whoop. All right, so motherboard I'm putting in, Gigabyte B450M DS3H. Uh, this is a budget motherboard because it's a budget gaming PC we're building, but it's actually not bad. Um, maybe I should review budget motherboards. Who knows? Let's get this out of the packet and I'll show you a bit more about it. I'm going to take that out as well. We're not going to need those SATA cables, but I'll remove them anyway. And rear panel, we're going to need that. And the rest of that is all paper and cardboard that I don't care about. Right, so the motherboard we're putting in, that's this boy here. And it's okay. This is a budget board with a B series chipset in, which would normally be, you know, B for budget. But we've got six USBs at the back, um, and we've got 
um, an M2 slot on it. Uh, and we've also got some SATA ports, we've got front USB, um, and we've also got a little heatsink on the VRM so it won't die after a couple of years. Because something I've noticed is that if you don't have any kind of heatsink on the VRMs, that will be what kills your motherboard, I think, because I've seen a couple of boards that, um, that have been dead, and the only explanation has been that the VRMs have just cut copped it from having too big a CPU in there. So yeah, and we've got a nasty little audio circuit in the bottom left. That concludes my review of this motherboard. So yeah, ham instead of RAM. Yeah. <laughs> the B450's mid-range. What's the AMD budget one then? I assume this was the... So that's the equivalent of the uh, Intel H series then. The old the A series. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, that's not bad then. I suppose when you get down to the A series, you're probably paying, what, 20 or 30 quid for the motherboard? B can be overclocked. Oh, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. So yeah, and we've got four RAM slots on this as well, which isn't bad for a budget board. I think this was uh, 40 or 50 quid, something like that. So yeah, it's not bad. Okay, let's match it up in the case so we can see where our screws are gonna go. And then we're gonna mount up our CPU and stuff on the board and we're gonna post test it. Which isn't really necessary for such a simple build like this, but it's good practice that I'm trying to get into. Um, right, so on this one, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we need a hold, we need a, uh, a standoff there. 50 quid for an ASRock full ATX. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Oh, Discord noise. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, it's not from me. I don't have Discord open. Unless you're hearing my laptop from across the room, that'd be quite impressive. I want to look at this bracket system, but we'll look at that later on. They have given me some standoffs. No, they haven't. Oh, no. Oh, they've done the worst thing. Look at this. They haven't given me real standoffs. They've given me... They've given me these horrid plastic standoffs. Boo, not cool. I'm not putting one of those in there. That's not cool. That'll do. Standoff, done. Ah, and there's my standoff screwdriver. I wonder what happened to that. I put it in the pot where I keep my standoffs. Fancy that. Very faint, but yeah, laptop, okay. Shall I put it back in there? No, because then I won't, then I won't find it. And yeah, that was my laptop. <laughs> I'm gonna go and mute my laptop, one sec. Just for the sanity of my viewers. Cool, all right, so that is ready to receive our board. Let's prep up and post test the board. Oh, I can't because I've already put the power supply in the case. No guts, no glory, we're fitting the motherboard. <laughs> Ugh. Ram in place, donezo. And then, oh, putting the shield in upside down, oh, nightmare, yeah. I, you know, I think I've done that before. I think I've done that. Uh, it'll be 2400, Hugh. I always buy 2400. It's generally the best bang for buck. And yep, single RAM stick. Um, this is an 8 gig module for a budget build. And I, when I'm doing an 8 gig build, I always buy... Um, let's uh, zoom in a bit. I always buy a single 8 gigabyte stick because then it's nice and easy for the customer to just drop another 8 gig stick in later on. And this Corsair Vengeance LPX is common as muck. So they can just very easily drop in a second eight gigabyte module, uh, you know, later on down the line and pop it up to 16. Yep, that's right for future expansion. Um, so yeah, and not having dual channel uh, doesn't have very much impact unless you're using onboard graphics. If you're using onboard graphics, RAM speed is everything. However, we've got a Radeon RX 570 going into this, so we don't have that problem. Here's our Ryzen CPU, which is a Ryzen 5 2400G. And this is a really good budget CPU. It's got not all full graphics built into it, but we're not gonna be using them. I mainly bought it because it's a not awful CPU. So, and there's our cooler. We're gonna be using the uh, stock cooler, which is the AMD 
Spire, I think this one is called. And the Spire Cooler is not bad. So we're going to be using that fella. So let's get our CPU in. Open that up. There we go, one Ryzen chip. And unlike uh, on Slink's build that we did recently, this is a uh, PGA chip, so it's got the big pin grid array on the bottom of it. So you've got to watch out you don't bend any pins. And I believe that goes in uh, that way up on this guy. Where's my... Where's the triangle? I think the arrow is in the bottom left. I'm 99% certain it goes in that way up. Yep, it does. There we go. And give it a wiggle. Patented adamant IT wiggle. Done. And now this CPU cooler, I believe, runs its... Doesn't use the hold down clamps. No, it doesn't. Oh, this is the baby one. So it's a little, little short boy. However, it's got a nice big fan on it. That's what makes this AMD cooler not terrible, is it's got a nice big uh, low noise, high flow fan on it. Um, and despite the fact that the heatsink itself is tiny, these things are actually not too shabby. Uh, and it's got a nice hold down mechanism with these four screws as well, which are, um, although this one isn't as effective as the RAF Max cooler, which is what the top AMD cooler is with all the RGB on it, um, this one, I actually prefer the fitting on it because I don't like these clamps. I've never liked them ever since AMD started using them years and years ago. So we're going to remove these, which means it's supposed to be slightly quieter, but uh, I think they're all the same. And the answer to that is they're quiet when they're on a decent fan profile. Um, the a recent build, I, a recent AMD build I did, um, I fitted uh, the RAF Max cooler and it was noisy as heck. However, later on, for other reasons, uh, I did a BIOS update on the motherboard, which improved the fan profiles, and suddenly it was quiet as a mouse. So if you're, if you're doing one of these builds, it's worth checking your fan profiles after you do the build. Uh, okay, right. All the writing on the motherboard that is vertical is facing in that direction, so I'm going to put it on that way around, so the AMD logo points in the same direction. And I can even... There we go. Now that one points in the same direction as well. So I'm just going to pop you on there and screw that down normal spire's got a copper slug yeah that is that is one of the things that i do notice about this one is there's no copper in it at all and that's just okay i mean to be honest it's not big enough to benefit from it um the the weakness of this one is just simply a low amount of actual metal um you know there's not very much metal in this cooler and that just means that uh um, the fan has got to do more work but you know this is not going to have a hard life, this one, so I'm okay with that. And I'm just screwing those down to the stops. There we go. Donezo. All fitted. Ready for the ball. Uh, and will that go all the way around? No, it won't. So I'm just going to reroute this cable. There we go. And that cable's tucked out of the way. And the last thing I need to do is I'm going to stick in the M2 SSD while I'm here as well. We've got a Crucial MX500 here which is a, uh, <clears throat> as far as uh, M2 SSDs go, it's budget, because this is not an NVMe SSD, which means it's basically a serial ATA SSD that they crammed into the M2 size. But uh, I used to have one of these in my computer at home, and then I upgraded to a Samsung uh, NVMe, and I didn't notice the difference. Unless you're doing a really hardcore IO stuff, like lots of VMs and stuff like that, I can't tell the difference. So yeah, food for thought. The nice thing is though, is despite being a quote unquote budget SSD, these MX 500s look really nice. As you can see, it's got the really nice, it's got the really nice black label on it with the Crucial logo, which actually looks half decent in my opinion. And it does actually have an activity LED on it, which flickers away as you use it. So I think they're not awful. I like the MX 500, so there. Uh, right, this motherboard is ready to go into the computer, so let's get it fitted. I'm just going to move all on my packaging out of the way. And that guy can just drop into there now. And I'm just going to work it around all the other cables. And I'm just looking to get it lined up into the I.O. shield. And... Trap for young players, quite often the I.O. shield will have little prongs sticking out of it that are supposed to contact the tops of the connectors 
And if you're not careful, those prongs will go into the connectors, specifically the USB and the Ethernet connector. Uh, however, this one does not have those prongs, so I don't need to worry about them. Are our standoffs metric or imperial? They are all metric. So I need seven metric screws. There's the metric imperial shootout. So you can see the imperial screw has a much coarser thread on it. And the, the imperial is the coarse. The metric has the fine M3 thread on it. Uh, and standoffs can be either or. Most of the other screws are standardized. Um, however, standoffs can be both. They can be either or. Um, let me see, do they always have those heads? No, not necessarily. Um, the, the metric screws commonly, actually, that's an interesting thing to point out is that the imperial screws often have the big hex heads like that. Let's uh, focus again. Imperial screws uh, often have these big hex heads on them and the metric ones are often these flat round boys, but that is not standard. That's common, but not standard. I've got, in my trays of screws, I have all manner of designs of screw heads for both imperial and metric. So yeah, that's not standard. So you can't use that as an indicator as to what you have. Uh, where is my other, there it is, I found it. I keep losing my screwdrivers under boxes. I'm gonna throw all of this off the counter. Get out of here. I don't need you in my life. Right. So we're going metric across the board and down there. So as you can see, we've actually got quite a lot of headroom on this case. And I fully believe that there is enough room for a 240 mil water cooler there, like without cramming it in either. Because there are a lot of cases that claim to be compatible with water coolers, but when you, and they've got just because they have the mount points. But when you look inside them, you, you're just like, that's not gonna work. However, that is legit got the headroom for it. So yeah, that's not bad, Obama. Cool, let's plug in our ATX cable. And uh, I'm gonna let this guy stick out a little bit. I would like to get that excess into the back of the case. I think we will still be able to do that. We'll plumb that back a bit in a minute once we've got everything plugged in, I think. Uh, have I got that? Yeah, that needs to turn 180 degrees. That's why that felt wrong. And our CPU power cable. I'm just going to put a little bend in that wire. Still be able to get... Uh, ooh, good question, well presented. Could you still get the CPU power cable out the hole with the water cooler there? Um, I think you'd get away with it. That would be a little bit on the tight side. You might have to do a little bit of cable wrangling there, but I think it would work. I think you could do that. Uh, right, our case fan is going to plug in down there. So I'm not going to take off that cable tie, just because then I've got more working space. Let's just go a bit sideways and focus. However, I'm going to trim off this stupid Molex connector because uh, I'm not a peasant. So we're going to go right back there and just go snip. The reason why they put this on there is just in case you don't have any fan headers on your motherboard. But who doesn't have any fan headers on their motherboard? Not me. Right. Plug that dude in down there into chassis one. That's a three pin fan into a four pin header, which is absolutely fine. Modern motherboards can always auto detect when there's a three pin fan plugged into a four pin header and they will adjust the speed control as appropriate. There we go. Uh, right, that's that. So now I need to reroute these front panel cables to where they're gonna go. So everything is gonna come out the bottom because our front USB, our front panel connectors, it's all along the bottom of the case. So I'm gonna run all of these around the back of the case. So let's come out slightly and flip the case around. Those are cool, these cable ties. They just kind of work in any way around. Well, I'm 90 degrees. I am now. I love having a camera that's got a 90 degree field of view because it just means when you want to bring the, the, fit, the frame out just that little bit more, I can just go 
90 degree field of view and I just get that little bit of zoom out, which is really helpful when you're working on something big and bulky and you're trying to film it. It's very handy. Just a little bit of zoom without the quality loss. Right. So all of these, I'm just going to go straight down the back here. And what's the shortest? It's the front panel connectors. Those are going to reach, though. Yeah, that's all fine. So I can actually put those through here as well, which I'm going to do. And we'll see if we can tidy these a bit, because the problem is with the white side panel at the back, those cables are going to be really noticeable. So we'll see if we can do anything about that afterwards. Let's just get everything hooked up first. So um, I tell you what else is slightly annoying is on the Game Max, on the Game Max power supply, with it fan side down, we just have that on show, not a Game Max logo or something. That's a bit short-sighted of them, but okay. Look at my power rails. <laughs> So the audio is going to go down to the bottom left here. So I'm just going to run that across. Oh, it's only just long enough to do that run. We can do it. Right, where's my USB 2 headers? There's the white ones down there. So let's bring you guys in a bit closer while I do the fiddly wiring. And as a special treat, I'll do my best not to have my hands right in the way of everything. So I'm going to feed the USB 2 header back through. And missing pin is there, missing pin is there, so that's going to go that way around. That's that one in place. Then there's our front panel connectors, and the USB 3 is going to go on top of it. And I'm going to, oh, the USB 3 is going to be the problem, child. This is actually a really horrid connector, this. It's extremely, uh, it's extremely heavy duty for what it does. Uh, okay, let's check our pins. Reset switch. Hard drive LED. Power pin is on the left because they've uh, they have labelled it. There's that one. Then my power switch goes on the top right, and then my power LEDs. Negative goes on the right and the positive goes on the left. Get in there, come on. This is why I have nails. Don't bite your nails, kids. You'll need them for plugging in your front panel headers. There we go, donezo. And now I just need to do something with this USB 3 cable. So I'll feed some of the excess back and I'll just put in a bit of a loop there because this cable is just too, too heavy duty to really pin back and plug that in and that's just going to get in the way of everything but it's what the USB 3 header does there we go that's all right the graphics card is actually going to sit pretty low in this case it's going to be like there um, so we don't need to worry about these cables being on show too much um, I would like this to be like over here or something but there's not much I can do about that it's adequate it's all right. Okay, and on the subject of graphics cards, I think it's time to put in a graphics card. So I'm gonna push all this to one side over here and move that over there. And it's time for another unboxing. Ah, Optimus Prime box or whatever, complete with thing. Right, okay, so this is an RX 570. I haven't worked with one of these before, but this was incredibly well priced, this graphics card. It goes toe to toe with a 1060, but it's actually about 50 quid cheaper. So um, so yeah, I was like, oh, I'm on board with that. That came into our budget. The budget for this tower was 500. Um, so for 500 quid, we could just about squeeze in by just like, you know, by skimping on that motherboard and the RAM slightly, we could squeeze in this 570. Uh, I'm not a fan of Asus, but that you know, for their, their their graphics cards and stuff like that are all right. Not a huge fan of their motherboards, but everything else is good though. Right, let's get this bad boy out and take a look at it. Is there anything exciting in the box? There isn't. How boring. However, one thing I did notice about this box though, 
if we have a look at the headline features of this graphics card, check it out. We've got DirectX 12, we've got Vulkan, we've got FreeSync 2, we've got Relive Capture, and we've got Chill. This graphics card has Chill. There's the box gone. Just as well it's not a 1650. Uh, oh, it's the 1650 out, because the 1660 I know was a thing. I'm not sure why the 16 series exists, to be brutally honest. It's trash. Oh, that makes me sad. Yeah. I don't know why the 16 series exists. The 10 series is doing fine, and for the new ones, we've got a 10, we've got a 2060, a 2070, and a 2080, and the 2080 Ti. I don't understand why the 16 series needs to exist, but that's it. That's actually rather nice. This is an updated version of the Gigabyte GPU cooler. Um, most Gigabyte cards have got a very similar looking cooler to this, but it's uh, more plasticky looking. I mean, this is still plastic, but it doesn't look as nice as this. And this guy's got, oh, look at that. That's, uh, that's triple heat pipes under there. We've got three heat pipes. And according to the box art, those are direct contact heat pipes. So those heat pipes go right onto the GPU, which is really good for cooling. Cables are about how you're doing. I guess I'll just tuck those under the heat sink out of sight. You know, like this, this plastic cover is literally supposed to cover those up. Thanks, guys. Got some fluff in there as well. It's a bit how you're doing. All right. And we've got an 8-pin connector. That's, um, that's quite surprising, but then it is an AMD. So being AMD, it's going to use more power than a small star. Uh, it has a metal backplate on it. That's quite nice. And that backplate is functional. You have a look down there. That's got, you can just see under the heat, under the backplate there, that's got thermal pads going onto the VRAM. Uh, nothing going onto the back of the VRMs or anything, but you wouldn't expect that. But that is a functional backplate. That's pretty cool. Uh, let's get this guy in the computer. All right. So the top blanking plate is this plastic jobby, which just unclips and comes out. That's kind of natty, I guess. So, however, we're not actually gonna use the top slot. So I'm gonna leave that in because um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of micro ATX boards, they forego the top slot and use the second one down. So you've got room for your M2 card there. So we're gonna take out two of these bits here. I'm gonna give it a bit of a wiggle. When you, I should have done this before we started the build, actually. When you're removing these, you've got to be careful that you don't scratch up your motherboard while removing these little plates here. That can happen. Trap for young players. All right, that's done. We're ready to slot in our graphics card. So, in it goes. It's going to look baller. This thing is going to look nice. I quite like this build. Oops. It helps if I remove the covering plate off of the uh, PCI Express card edge. That'll help. I have a suspicion that Hugh had spotted that. <laughs> right. And as you can see, the disadvantage of using of skipping that top slot is we do actually have very low clearance. That is one issue that this computer would have. I'm going to put in some screws to hold this in place while I do that. These ones will be imperial. Right. Yeah, as I say, there's uh, when people say a stream PC and stuff like that, that's it, it basically for me, if someone said that they were building a stream PC, to me, that would suggest that they've got a bit more CPU than you'd normally consider necessary. And it also means that you would be aiming for motherboards with lots of USB connectors on as well, because streaming rigs typically have quite a lot of USB accessories plugged into them. So having all of those USB ports does count. There's our graphics card plugged in. And we're just making sure that none of those cables are gonna clip the fans on the inside there either, which they're not. Uh, here we go, here's a good example. You can just see that locking connector there isn't, can, uh, it's hard to see on the camera, but it's not quite closed properly. And I can tell because it's slanted. I'm just gonna give that a bit of a rock and there we go. That's just clicked shut there now. I'm happy with that. Right, we've got everything in the computer, so now we just need to do some tidying up. I'm gonna put this back panel back on, and then I'm just gonna quickly show off uh, a little gadget that the uh, case came with, which is kind of funky, that I will share with you guys. And that is a graphics card support bracket, 
which I don't think we're going to need, to be honest, because this graphics card has a backplate that helps support it. Um, but I'll demonstrate it just for posterity, because it's a nifty feature. So when the PC is standing upright, if you've got a big graphics card in your computer, it's going to sag down. This one is actually pretty rigid, but other graphics cards will go Wah, slightly. And it just looks a bit, they just look a bit sad. They just go Bleh. And it looks really naff. Um, however, what we've got here is a graphics card support bracket. And it doesn't really work in this case. It, you would need a taller case for this to be effective. But we've got some holes along the bottom of the case here. Um, and you'd put that guy like there, and then this guy would clip on thusly, and you've got a little leg up there, and you'd mount that just underneath and adjust it just so it supports the graphics card and stops it from sagging. So this isn't the best, That's it's not the best implementation of one I've seen. It's not the smartest one. Uh, the NZXT H200 um, comes with uh, is a similar sized case to this, and that comes with just a little foot, and uh, it's like an adjustable foot that you get on the bottom of furniture, where you twist it and it gets taller. So you put it under there and you just twist it, and it's just a little leg that just goes and just props up your graphics card. So that's kind of interesting. Um, right, Hugh, are you thinking of an RTMP PC? I don't see the point in those because. Um, uh, one of our one of our friends um, uh, one of our friends Flink was running uh, an RTMP PC for a while, and I didn't understand why. I yeah yeah George, George agrees yeah for restreaming yeah I yeah I I don't see the benefit of it personally. I don't see the benefit. Right, uh, I'm going to tidy up the cables on the other side, and then I think we're ready to start closing this thing up. I just want to tie these cables back just so as much of them are out of sight as possible. So I'm going to adjust these cables and just try and get them lined flat with each other. And then if I zip tie them together, they'll stay out of sight from the rest of it. And I might... No, I can't reorder those. It's too late. That's fine. I'm just going to zip tie them up. And there were a couple of zip ties that came with the, uh, that came with the power supply that I can use for that. So I'm going to put one up here. Uh, RTMP is um, it's the it's the basic form of stream. It's the basic protocol for streaming video that most stuff is based on. Uh, if if my if I'm saying that correctly, yeah. And having an RTMP an RTMP PC, it's basically just rebroadcasting your stream. Um, so you would have it next to your main computer. Your main computer broadcasts to the RTM, RTMP rig, and then the RTMP rig broadcast to a couple of streaming websites and actually does this send out to the internet. However, because it doesn't handle all of your overlay and stuff like that, which is what a dedicated, like when you run a dual streaming PC setup, the idea is, is that you have a PC running the game, which is then capture carding into a PC that's handling all the video encoding and the overlay and the chat and all the rest of it. However, an RTMP PC isn't doing any of that. It's just retransmitting what this one is doing. So apart from streaming to multiple websites, I don't see the value of it personally. I think it's people... Some people tend to set up dual PC setups for their streaming without really understanding what they're trying to achieve. And they say, so, oh yeah, I do this. And I'm like, but why? What is that actually achieving? And the answer to that is not a lot. Right, we'll just tuck those ones back there a little bit. Uh, actually, that's fine. Or can I pull that through? That's a bit of excess. Can we just pull that back up? Just to make that about the same length as the others. These are not horrendously tidy, these bits, but they're okay. Um, I don't know, Hugh. I haven't seen any, graphic, any capture cards that do higher than uh, 60 FPS because... Um, I don't think there would really be a market for it. Most people who are getting up to that kind of stage are more interested in... Um, I'm just standing this thing up so I can put the screws in the back. Or I can just turn it over so you guys can see what I'm doing. I think most people would be pushing for 4K at that point. 4K streams instead. 
But then on the other hand, uh, I've yet to, uh, yeah, I, I've yet to see the benefit of going past 60 frames a second. I guess it would be good for uh, your own gaming experience. However, the audience would definitely not need it. It's good for the gamer, but uh, the audience doesn't really need it, I don't think. Oh man, yeah, 4K 120 frames per second. That would be crazy, but also just the bandwidth you would need for that would be nuts. Just playing stuff back at 4K is punishing enough. So there's mounts here uh, in the case for two and a half inch drives. So you could put SSDs there, that'll look kind of funky. So if we had an SSD there, ugh, that would look like that. You'd have an SSD mounted down the bottom there and you could have two. And that's that would look kind of funky. I quite like that layout. Because we're using an M2 card, we don't need to worry about that. But that's why we've got empty spaces there, and that's kind of cool. Um, I'm still a bit weirded out by just having no fan at the front, but it doesn't need one, I guess. So yeah, I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, it's just really strange just having no front intake, but I'm okay with it. Uh, let's do a post test and find out if this bad boy works. And then I think we're ready to start tidying up so, and install like windows and stuff. So here we go. Ugh. Any bets? Is it going to post? We'll find out after these messages from our sponsors that I don't have. Bob, power up and power. All right. It's doing things. That fan doesn't know if it's coming or going, does it? I think the power. I think the motherboard is power cycling a couple of times, which is quite normal for a brand new board. I'm worried. I know for a fact that when the activity light on an MX500 SSD like that. Oh, there we go. It's gone out now. When that LED stays on stock, that means the SSD is not initializing. There we go. Reboot and select proper boot device. That is post. We got it. It does live. So our build is done, and uh, I've got to say this was uh, this it was a it was an okay case to build in. Again, all of this has got to bear in mind that this is a budget case costing just thirty five pounds. You know, so I'm not expecting I'm not expecting this to be as pleasant to build in as a premium grade case like an NZX Z yeah, like an NZXT or something like that. You know, that's that's not going to happen on this price budget. However, considering how cheap it was, it was pretty good. We had cable tidying around the back. I could route the cables where I wanted to. And while the clearances were a little bit tight in some places, everything fitted where I wanted it to go, which was really nice. Um, I was, I'm still slightly, well, I mean, I say I'm slightly perplexed by the lack of any kind of front intake on it. But the thing is, is that in small builds like this, I never fit front fans anyway. Um, and... I mean, I suppose though, personally, I really like having front mount radiators if you've, if you've fitted a water cooler. I prefer a front mount radiator to a top mount because I think having the radiator out the front balances the internal layout of the case better. But that's an aesthetic thing. Um, I think it looks nicer to have the bulk, some of the bulk out at the front rather than having all of the bulk just stacking up vertically inside the case. The overall build, though, has come out really nicely. Um, I mean, uh, despite having a Game Max power supply in there, um, we've got the uh, the power supply's tech specs on show rather than a nice Game Max logo, which is I found slightly odd, but that's fine. Most of the time, you're going to have your power supply's logo on show there, and that's a nice touch. I like that because it's kind of a shame that these days you can spend a lot of money on a really nice power supply, and it's just kind of hidden away in the enclosure. And I think that's one of those just nice little touches that I quite like. Um, the rear fan, I'm slightly, I'm slightly bummed out about that because the rear fan has got a really nice LED effect on it. However, it only comes on when the fan is at about 70% speed. Otherwise, there's not enough juice there to power the LEDs because it's a three pin fan. And that makes me really sad because if they can afford to put in the LEDs and like the little, rum, the, the little rubber anti-vibration mounts and stuff like that, why didn't you make it a PWM fan? Because if it were a, P a four pin PWM fan, those LEDs would work regardless of the speed of the fan, you know, like a, like premium ones do. So that's one of those like, ah, oh, you know, it's just, 
just the slightest bit more effort would have made this fan much better. But as it stands, I'm like, no, I'm not running a fan at 70% speed just to make it light up, you know. However, you know, I've got the fan profiles dialed in. So when the CPU warms up, the fan kicks on. So that'll look nice, you know. Uh, the other thing as well is the, the top USB, again, you know, with the USB 2 ports there, like, I understand that they're trying to cater toward the low-end market where USB 3 might not be available. But with that much being said, again, save the money in adding the USB 2 ports and instead include a USB 3 to 2 adapter. And those exist where you have a USB 3 header socket that then pins down into a USB 2 header socket. And that means that if you've got USB 3 top ports, but no USB 3 inside, you can just pin those into a USB 2 header, no problem. And again, that I feel like that probably would cost the same amount to manufacture, surely. Um, so yeah, there's just a couple of oversights where you're like, I think you could improve this without changing the bill, the, the cost of the case. Um, but yeah, the, the, the front design of it is really nice. They've got this modern style thing where we have just a single sheet that's been folded at the front. So the front panels look really cool. I like the fact that it comes in different colors. I like the fact that the top bit has a magnetic grill on it as well. Uh, and the actual top panel, we've got a nice big power button and reset button and stuff, and those look nice. Considering the cost of this thing, the it feels, um, you know, it does feel like a really, pre you know, I don't want to say it feels like a premium case, but it doesn't feel like it costs 35 quid. You know, this feels like a, like a 50 pound case to me like a 40 or a 50 quid case. Um, and yeah, I just overall, I thought it was really good. I like the top, the, the top clearance at the very top. By having that extra inch, there is room for a water cooler and there is room to route your cables. And that's worth a lot to me. The side panel was really funky. I mean, obviously at this price tag is asking a lot to have tempered glass, although the Aerocool Cyclone has tempered glass. But then the Aerocool Cyclone made a lot of cutbacks in other places in order to have that tempered glass. Swings and roundabouts. Between the two, I would buy this again over the Aerocool, to be honest. So yeah. It's worth noting that Inwin make a case that looks just like this. I have a suspicion that Inwin designed this thing. Um, uh, however, the Inwin version, I think, doesn't have the windowed side panel, which is why I went for the Game Max version in the end. So yeah. Uh, but the internal layout on that will be the same. So yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, and they fitted an awful lot into a very small case. And yeah, I think it looks fantastic. I'm really happy with this thing. And that is a cracking budget micro ATX case. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for watching everyone. I'll see you all next time. And uh, don't forget Game Max, I liked this. You can always send me more stuff. Chill, chill, chill. <laughs> see you all next time.